Okay, so this, this is also a brief note on some of these ideas uh, on, on conceptual theater and uh, thought trees and, um, well, you know, con conceptual ideas. Um, this idea of this ACC is the ACME uh, conceptual conveyor, and it's sort of related to, to the idea of, you know, of, of a, there, if you, the, the source of this is really very funny, it's really just a very cool uh, uh, cartoon. Um, uh, called uh, 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 Rocky and Bullwinkle Show, and it's an animation cartoon, very old, and it really has to, it's really sort of cool because it has so much, it has so much connection to a lot of modern uh, animation work. Uh, there were two two chaps. There's actually a whole story in this, and I'm sure there's some you can, you can Google, and it's the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle, and Rocky is R O C K Y, and Bullwinkle is B U L L W I N K L E. So it's Rocky is Rocket, uh, Rocket J is in le the letter J is in uh, uh, Joe or uh, uh, Joe or Jill or um, J uh, Jot or Joan or John or something. Um, and then uh, Rocket J Squirrel and Mo Bullwinkle J Mu Moose in the letter J. And so if you notice in The Simpsons, there's also it's Homer J Simpson and it's um, um, Bart J Simpson. And so J stands actually for J, J A Y. And one of the creators of the the series was a guy by the name of Jay uh, North, and it's very funny because the whole history is very interesting because the two creators of the series one was very conservative, one was very liberal, and out came this whole thing. And there's additional uh, little, uh, cool things. There's a guy by the name of uh, Edward Everett Horton uh, who did a thing a little, was used to the narrator a thing called Fractured Fairy Tales, the retelling of uh, Grimm's fairy tales as well as many other stories and. Uh, uh, in, in sort of odd ways, you know, there's a twist ending and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also uh, Mr. Peabody's Improbable uh, History, and Mr. Peabody starts the very serious, he's a, he's a very intelligent dog, and he has a, he, uh, you know, a boy, if a boy can own a dog, then why can't a dog own a boy? So Mr. Peabody goes to court and adopts a boy called Sherman, and uh, Sherman also has glasses, they both have glasses, and he has a, uh, a way back machine, uh, which is a time machine, and they go back. And of course, it's all very funny because you know you go back to ancient Rome, and it says, "As luck would have it, we arrived during rush hour." And so you see ancient Rome, and there's cars from the 20th century, uh, which is of course 1900C, and uh, the new new time thing I'm pushing these days. Um, very funny, and um, that's pretty much it. And that's just uh, the whole thing. And then there's a, an ongoing thing with uh, 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 Bullwinkle. And, uh, and and uh, the Bullwinkle the Moose, and um, they live in Frostbite Falls, and there's of course two spies from, um, I guess it was the Cold War, so there's sort of a thing between uh, the group, uh, Frostbite Falls, and a place called Potsylvania, and of course there's uh, uh, Boris Badenov, uh, sort of play on words, on the, same, the name of the play, very good cool play by the way, by a Modest Musorgsky called Boris Gudenov, and Boris Gudenov is a famous uh, um, Russian czar, and there's the false Dmitri, and of course I was obviously Dmitri, um, so the real Dmitri and the false Dmitri, so it's a long story, of <laughs> that sort of thing. But it's really cool, it's a nice play. And so they took Boris Goodenough and made it Boris Badenov and Natasha uh, Femme Fatale, and of course a fearless leader, and Mr. Big, and many other sort of odd characters just thrown in for a uh, uh, and, and Martians and Moon Men and uh, Upsidasium and anti gravity compound. There was a little bit of a science fiction thrill to it. So you could go into that. And so, uh, completely wandering off the idea, um, that's the idea of at least uh, the origin of these things. So the, 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 uh, the, the Wayback Machine, also check out archive, A R C H I V E dot org, and it has a lot of the old uh, websites. And it was an early, early thing for like the last 12 or 15 years or so. And uh, archive.org also has almost everything that you can get in terms of, of music and text and so forth. And it parallels the Gutenberg uh, project. And Gutenberg, as I've learned, I always like G-U-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. I mean, if you're going to have one letter in a, in, in a word, you might as well have two. So, of course, it's actually G-U-T-E-N, single T, uh, B-E-R-G. And there's only one G at the end and one R. And, uh, there's two. Oh, I get... 
confused with counting letters since it's right. Uh, no, nonetheless. Anyway, so that's the idea of the conceptual conveyor, and it's related to this idea of a, of a time conveyor. But con uh, you know, you could uh, time space conveyor, the Linnaean, uh, after uh, the, the Swedish uh, uh, botanist and uh, sorry, zoologist, a bi uh, biologist, who came up with the idea of the, bi the binary classification system. In the case, it, is it a is it a is it a mammal? Yes or no? If it's a mammal, then it's a mammal. Uh, well, it's not a mammal. Is it a fish? And he said yes. So. Um, the, there's a, there's mammals, there's um, uh, fishes, which is actually Pisces, but that's sort of why it creates a thing called fishes, which actually say fish is the plural, King's English, for the plural of a fish. So I have nine fish in my aquarium, you see, but it's, they're all of the, um, I think it's the order or the phylum. The phylum would be, I think, animal. And the classification of the, the family would be it's, it's their fishes or Pisces, which is the old Greek word, of course, and insect insect uh, as well. And there's also um, the, the phylum and the chordata, chordate, which have a, the backbone, and, and uh, they don't have a backbone. It's like an insect or a certain kind. Of, of course, plants. You know, they don't have backbones, and they're plants rather than animals. And of course, it became very more much more complicated than Linnaeus probably could have imagined, or, or not. I'm not sure. Very, very smart chap. And because uh, we have um, funguses and ferns, uh, my, my particular area I like it, is enjoy uh, plants or botany, you know. So. And uh, anyway, so they have all kinds of conveyors, and they're, they're ways of transporting from one idea, one thing to another. So we could maybe get in a car and, or a bicycle or walk or swim, especially if we're a dolphin or a whale, and uh, you could swim from one place to another. And uh, a bicycle, of course, is the only form of transportation more efficient than walking. Well, except for, you know, probably whales and dolphins, but then their skin is a very surface, a special surface. Which, of course, thanks to our, our pollution and so forth like that, a total disregard for our, uh, our, uh, our neighbors. I uh, had a, when I was grad, in graduate school, actually, there was a professor who had get, a guest prof professor who came to talk about the brain and brain chemistry and evolution and uh, the way the brain works and games and and keeping the brain the chemicals and all kind of diseases and stuff like this very quite you know this thing and where somebody had raised the, the question uh, oddly enough it wasn't me actually about you know dolphins and she said and he said well yes my wife is always talking about these dolphins if they're as if they're intelligent well if they're intelligent where are their cars where are their roads where are their buildings and i just was so stunned and then so you know they they, they swim they swim in the ocean they don't need cars or buildings or roads and they, they sing and they seem to be much more intelligent and, and peaceful than we are and of course so, you know the uh, star trek for the voyage home which was actually uh, the Russians, uh, Soviet Union, doing to, to, to discourage people from hunting these whales, actually showed it in in, in, their, in the country. So it's really cool. And they sing these songs, and it's a very beautiful kind of a. It's after the the you know uh, Wrath of Khan, well actually the, the Star Trek the movie the Wrath of Khan, which Isaac Asimov was the uh, uh, science consultant for. And uh, then um, there was Wrath of Khan, was of course Ricardo Montalban reprising his fantastic uh, Khan, uh, um, Aminia Singh, you know, this is this genetically altered person from 1999, obviously, and then arriving the 23rd century and from the original series, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, TNS, or TOS, sorry, quite sorry, that's sorry, TOS is the original series. and. Um, Anyway, so uh, where did we go? I guess that's where we are. So conveyors and the conceptual idea is you could have a grammatical structure. I could say, okay, um, and you see this in, in, in language and language processing and automatic translation and stuff. And so you might have a language thing. It says, okay, a, a sentence consists of a noun and a verb. And it's the simplest form. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm, see, see, I, I hold the glass. So I hold the glass and it's actually not the same. So I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm I, I look, I look, I look. I'm looking at the, t at the, the TV, at the, seat, the screen. So I look. So I is the subject, and then look is the object, or the verb actually, sorry. And I look, and so I look at the screen. So then we have a more complex a sentence, a subject, a thing that's acting. That's me, it's in and out of focus here. The screen is out of focus. So um, well, it's a project adjective. So you can see how it gets, but it's just English. It's a King's English. I'm sorry, I'm 
to speak because otherwise, you know, I had a problem with the, the, the cows who were drinking that water out of the tank and the problem is I was going to go down and get sampled from them and take it in the dice and have some professor look at it and I think it might be some sort of uh, problem. The same cows seem to be giving bad milk. I'm not sure. Because obviously it's fortunate enough that I was exposed to vast quantities, not of, of bad water or, or odd milk, but of the Monty Python's flying circus which fit in with, of course, the concepts of the con absurd, uh, pataphysics, and, of course, um, um, well, you know, conceptual conveyors that have no purpose other than perhaps to convey the fact that life may or may not make sense on Tuesdays, especially if the series was canceled before. Well, you see what I'm saying. But that's just nonsense, isn't it? So, but out of nonsense... Ah, yes. Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, good play, and the uh, film version, two firm film versions actually, but I remember uh, with, um, with uh, uh, Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein was in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. No, the, the actor who played Young Frankenstein um, was was um, Peter Boyle. No, he's the monster. Peter Boyle's a monster. Well, he seemed rather nice when I was chatting, and I saw him on Saturday Night Live. No, no, he played the monster, see, and it's then reference of the thing and referred to as the object. And, of course, you know, we go to a very famous statement of the White Knight and Alice in Wonderland talking about, well, he's, he's going to uh, recite a poem, and the poem is called this and just known as that, and the poem actually is this, and then I think you would actually say the poem, which would be the fourth thing, and you would say it in English, and you could say it with an accent, you could say it quickly, that's the, the quality of the way that it's spoken, and those are properties of speech, and then it gets more and more complex. And we really haven't even gotten to uh, anything involving uh, calculus and, uh, and, di and differential equations yet. Or for that matter, actually, um, a cellular meiosis and mitosis and nuclear fusion and fission, and, uh, um, and and fish, fishing and and uh, in season, I mean, it's like thirty dollars for the fish, fishing license, and uh, of course it becomes more and more absurd as you go. But of course uh, the idea is as long as we're careful to re uh, respect re uh, the capacities of the earth for renewable resources, there will always be not only re resources and resources, and uh, it's, I think it's Beetlebaum in the third at Santa Anita which, of course, is Spike Jones. Not to be confused with Spike Mulligan, and not to be confused, of course, with uh, spiking the ball in uh, volleyball, which is uh, considered actually a legal move. So one thing associates with the other, and it becomes a chain of logic, which has no real logic, other than play in words. Well, then that's pataphysical. And then Salford Jarrett. And again, once again, we return to the absurd. And not too unexpected and in election, in election years, or election years, or election years, are the election years, or the people of the election years, elections years, no, the election years of the election. And that's just English, the king, and pretty much the king's English, too. I think I might have left an apostrophe. I'm always trouble with when you put, if it was Miss, it was, it was, um, um, uh, Susan's dress, it's S-U-S-A-N, apostrophe S, Susan's dress. But if the person's name ends in an S, like um, um, Les's, Les's dress, so there's a person by the name of Les, and Les has a dress. So it'd be L-E-S-S -S -S and apostrophe S, or it would be L-E-S-S -S apostrophe S's, like Les's, or it would be L-E-S-S E-S apostrophe, or it'd be L-E-S, and there's one, and it could be a whole family of Les's living at, of course, you know, more drive. And then you can see the whole problem. And then, so this is the whole crux of the conceptual concept. Thank goodness I've given this, and I won't have to repeat this again, unless, of course, I actually do it as a performance piece. This is pretty much what I do, which just gets completely out of hand, and so I just usually stay in the corner, and only when... But it's not even... See, that Monty Python, and a lot of these things, they're not they're not, they're not uh, spontaneous. They're, they're very, very, very carefully rehearsed, and they're not um, ad-libbed, ad lib That's it. I have nothing else to say. And, uh, yes, this is uh, some, some pitted, firm, plump, and juicy ripe olives jumbo, 
as I can. So I try to clean out, and then I put you know pencils in them. And so here we get some pencils. There's a pen. Puts a pen in there. Well, actually, it's a, it's, a, it's sort of a kind of a, a since I'm an artist, I use these things like that. And then of course there's uh, this thing here. It's an adapter for the speaker. Put it in there. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, usually you don't put these. It's this little flashlight, and it's LED, very efficient, and used rechargeable batteries. There's a little button here, and you would take it off and put it in there and take it. And then recycle the plastic. See, it's already all works for nice. It has a little diagram, which is the instructions, and it shows which way uh, that you, you you mount it in, in the rocket and then send it to Mars. You see. I'm not sure if it's Mars, the candy bar, or Mars. The Mars, you know, Joe Mars and Sally Mars and Toby Mars, they live next to Moors, who live down the street from Les Nesman. Oh, well, I think it's just completely lost, and it's just rambling on incoherently, and uh, probably not particularly humorous. I have a great sense of humor. Just, I have no. I have, I have a great sense of humor. I just have any s timing sense and sense of uh, sensitive. Well.